finish the profile of Benjamin Harrison. We're going to finish some other things. We're going to have a review and a test tomorrow, so this will be a good time to pay attention. Backing up on the profile of Benjamin Harrison, we'll just review a little bit for Josh's sake. Benjamin Harrison was born on August 20th, 1833 on his grandfather's farm in North Bend, Ohio. He was named for his great-grandfather, who was an original signer of the Declaration of Independence. He was the second of ten children born to his parents. He attended Farmers College in Farmers Hill, Ohio for three years, and as a freshman he met his future wife, Caroline Scott. The two married in 1853 and had two children, a boy and a girl. After transferring from Farmers College, Harrison attended Miami of Ohio University, earning a law degree. He passed his bar exam and was a winner in his first big case. Okay? He was a deeply religious man, he taught Sunday school, and was a member of the Presbyterian Church. And that's where he ended. I said he served in the Civil War on the Union side. He earned the nickname Little Ben from his men under his command because of his height. He was only 5 foot 6 inches tall. And I think that's where I ended, didn't I? Okay, yeah. after the Civil War, he tried his hand at politics. He ran for the governorship of Indiana but was unsuccessful in his attempt. So after the Civil War, Harrison ran unsuccessfully for governor of Indiana. In 1881, two things of significance happened to him politically. First of all, he turned down a post in the cabinet of President Garfield. In 1881, he turned down a post in the cabinet of President Garfield. What would be something that might have you not accept a post if you're interested in politics, if you're given a post in a president's cabinet, what might keep you from taking the like party? Him. What? No? Good guess. You didn't like him? No, he actually got elected to the United States Senate that year, so he turned down the opportunity to serve in Garfield's cabinet. So he turned down a position in the cabinet of President Garfield because he had been elected to the United States Senate in 1881. Who votes for people named Senate? You, the people of America. Will they, will they vote for president? Sometimes it's they it's vote it's for it's they vote for senators they're up to. And what are midterm that's a good question. AD, what are midterm elections? You heard that term we have a midterm election for senators and congressmen. That means it's an election in which the president is not being elected. That's called a midterm election. Okay? And so when we vote for president, sometimes we vote for senators and congressmen. And sometimes when the president's not even up, because they only member of the House every two years, so those elections come more often than ever before. Okay? Now, he was elected president, we know that, of the United States in 1888, and during his administration as president, two very important laws were passed. Okay? Two very important laws were passed during the administration of Benjamin Harrison. First one was called the Sherman Antitrust Act. The Sherman Antitrust Act. Does anybody know what an antitrust or a Sherman antitrust thing? You don't have any idea what that might be about? Um, don't trust Sherman. No. Um, what's a trust? No. Okay, what, so what's a monopoly? You ever played the board game Monopoly? What's the idea in the board game Monopoly? Well, like to uh, make money. control the, uh, you know, a single thing. To, to control as much property on the Monopoly board, you can't get as many houses and hotels because every time somebody ends up on your spot, they have to pay you. The idea of Monopoly is to gain control of everything. And a trust is kind of the same thing. Now, at this time in history, there are a lot of monopolies or trusts that hindered trade in the United States. A lot of monopolies or trusts. Now, what's a monopoly? I'll tell you, I'll give you a good example of monopoly. You ever drive through Shoshone? Yeah. Okay, what's when you drive into Shoshone and get to the stoplight or whatever, what's the first thing you see or do? Gas station. You stop at that gas station and fill up or get yourself a treat. Do you know that the guy that owns that gas station bought the other gas station as well and doesn't and just closed it down so he had no competition? for that gas station. So he has a tremendous monopoly there. That's crazy. He bought them both and keeps one closed because everybody goes, that's got to be a gold mine. Every time I go through there, it's packed with people. Yeah. Well, there's a lot packed that you could make monopolies. Well, that's what this Sherman Antitrust Act is, but that's a little bit different. That's a loose termination monopoly. Now, 
If that guy bought out every single, if there were 15 gas stations in that town and all of them were littler businesses, and as a big business, he bought all those and then shut her down and people complained, that would be a monopoly. And that's exactly what this Sherman Antitrust Act did, is it outlawed big businesses, big businesses forming trusts because when a big, let me try to make this in layman's terms. So a big business, let's just use that example. Let's say that um, some guy is so rich that he buys every single gas outlet in the state of Wyoming. In other words, anybody that needs gas in their gas stations, he, they have to buy from this guy. So he charges them outrageous amounts of money for that gas in their gas stations, so he's the only one making profit. So during the 1880s, many big businesses formed these trusts, and they set prices so high that small businesses couldn't survive. And what the Sherman Antitrust Act did is that after these people complained, what happened is they set this law that stated you could no longer do that. Now, why don't people complain in Shoshone? Because he didn't probably he probably paid a pretty good price for that other gas station, and the guy thought, well, great. And his choice to shut it down just makes him more money. But if he'd have forced that guy out, if he'd have went in there and put his prices so low that the guy went out of business and bought him out, and the guy complained to government, that might be establishing a monopoly. See what I mean? So, but he did that as well. But that, that's a loose term. But that gas station in Shoshone has got to be a gold mine. I mean, every, there's somebody there all the time. And he didn't want any competition, so he bought the other gas station and shut it out. Okay, the second piece of legislation that was really important during Benjamin Harrison's term was the Dependent Pension Bill. The Dependent Pension Bill. Okay, Dependent Pension Bill. Who might he be thinking about that needed some money and some pension that were maybe dependent, that couldn't work very well, couldn't get a job? What's that? Not so much veterans. old. Veterans of? Civil War. There were many veterans in the Civil War that because of their injuries in the Civil War or whatever, could not perform manual labor and could not get jobs. So he passed through Congress the Dependent Pension Bill, which broadened the qualifications so that all Civil War veterans could get some pension money that could not perform manual labor. So they already had a pension bill in, plan, in place, but what he did is broaden it so it was easier to qualify, so he made sure that every Civil War veteran that fought in the Civil War that was disabled, that could not perform manual labor because of injuries, could be paid a pension so they could survive. Okay? Well, in the election of 1892, we'll talk about that. He's going to run for re-election, but he's going to be defeated. And we'll tell you how that goes in a minute. So Harrison ran for re-election in 1892, but he lost. It was kind of a double loss for him because two weeks before election day, his wife died. So he lost his wife two weeks before the election day, then lost the election on election day. So he had kind of a tough election campaign and Type of thing is his wife died during the campaign and he lost the election. So what does he do? What do presidents do normally when they get done being president? Retire. They usually retire, which he did. He returned to Indianapolis, Indiana. He retired from the presidency, but what did he begin to do that was his real trade? No, what did he get a degree in? Law. Law. He became a lawyer. So he, he left the presidency and he went to Indianapolis, Indiana, and he started to practice law. And in 1896, he remarried a lady by the name of Mary Lord Dimmick. Mary Lord Dimmick. And this is kind of a cool story. It reminds me of another cool story I'm going to tell you about. Mary Lord Dimmick was a lady who cared for his wife when she was very ill prior to dying. And he evidently liked her and cared for her. At first, your first reaction was, oh, wow, he was fooling around with this Mary Lord Dimmick while she was caring for his wife. That wasn't true. He appreciated so much how much that Mary Lord Dimmick had done for his wife when she was in their latter stages of before her death, and they became friends and later married. Okay, and they actually had a daughter together as well. So he remarried a lady that he was quite fond of. Which reminds me of a story I'll just tell you. A really good friend of mine, Laurel. Um, he was best friends with another guy that I don't know really well. Well, anyway, he got very sick with cancer, and and. 
Bob Horn was my friend's name, and he went and cared for this guy for like a year when he had cancer, and the guy was married and had a very nice wife, and uh, he, would, he would just help with yard work, and he was just a very, very, I mean, as good a friend as you could get. Well, the guy, during the latter stages, stages of his cancer, he said, he asked Bob if he would take care of his wife for him. And what he meant is he wanted someone to look after his wife and basically ask Bob if he would care enough for his wife to marry his wife. And they got, they were best friends. He knew his wife for years. But what Bob did is they, after, after his friend died, they began to, you know, be friends and end up, he married her and led, you know, okayed his pledge to his friend that he would take care of his wife, so he married his wife. It's kind of the neatest story ever. I don't know how much they really loved each other and stuff. I don't know the whole story behind that, but it's, it's been a very good marriage. Bob was never married. He was single his entire life, but when he got done caring for his friend, his friend asked him if he would not take care of his wife after he died. He did. He married her. It's been a great relationship. So those things can happen. Well, what else do presidents usually do after they're president? They usually write a book. And usually it's about their memoirs, normal, okay? And I've got some memoir books up here somewhere. I'm not sure where I've got Henry, uh, Harry Truman's memoirs. Memoirs are books that presidents write about themselves. Well, Harrison didn't write a memoir, but in 1897 he did write a book entitled This Country of Ours. So in 1887, that's a long time ago. That's over 100 years ago. 1890, excuse me, 1897. That'd be over 100 years ago? I think that'd be a hard book to find. But if you work hard enough, you can find one. <laughs> Here's the book right here. First edition, first printing. This country of ours. First edition, first printing ever. Yeah. yeah. 18, 1897. Printed by Charles Scribner's. Who's going to hold that? You know, I'm a, I'm a weird guy. I'm an eBay guy. So when I find stuff like this in my notes, I get on eBay and try to find it. But this is a first edition, first printing. Oh, sorry. Oh, sorry. It's not real good shape. I don't even remember. I've had it for quite a few years. But this is it. This is the first edition, first printing in this country of arms. Have you read it? No. I'm afraid to even open it up very much because I'm afraid it will fall apart. Finally, as people do, Benjamin Harrison died on March 13, 1901 in Indianapolis and is buried there. Okay. He died. On March 13, 1901, in Indianapolis, and that's where he's buried. I'm going to give you four little tidbits on President Harrison like I did. Was it President Cleveland? Yeah. Actually, number one, President Harrison was the first president ever from the state of Indiana. First president from the state of Indiana. Number two, it was during Harrison's administration that free mail delivery started. Before that, they charged, charged you for it. And they didn't even have it in some cases. You had to go into town and get your mail. So, free rural mail delivery started during Harrison's presidency. Harrison's presidency also became the first that we reached a billion, one billion dollar budget. In other words, the United States' budget during the Harrison administration was $1 billion. You know what a budget is? A budget is when you figure out how much money it's going to cost you to run the government. Okay? The school district has a budget. Okay? Mr. Nicholas is responsible for that, to make sure that he budgets enough money that we can pay for you guys to get educated, me to get paid, books, etc. And you don't want to go over your budget. Okay? So a billion dollar budget, he had the first one in the history of the country. Now, to give you a little bit of a scenario on what that means, this was what, 1888, right, to 1892, billion dollar budget. You know how much we spent in the Vietnam War before it was over? 109.5 billion dollars is what the Vietnam War cost us. 109 times what the entire federal government's budget was in 1888. <laughs> So it gives you an idea. And here's one of interest. Two states came into the Union during Harrison's term. Idaho and Wyoming. So two states came into the Union during the administration of President Harrison. Idaho and Wyoming. Yep. What number is our state? Like, I should 40. I don't know. 
don't know off the top of my head. I'll, I'll answer that for you. Really cool. Okay, we'll take us to our last subtopic before we have a little review for a test tomorrow, and that's the election of 1892. First, something new is going to happen in the presidency this way, too. 1892. Now, how many parties do we have? Republican and Democrat. Well, in this particular election, we're going to have a third party, and it's going to be called the Populist Party. Populist Party. And it was organized and formed by farmers. Usually when you have a third party, they don't normally win. They generally have an, they have an effect on the election sometimes, which I'll explain in a minute. So during this election of 1892, there were actually three political parties involved. Okay? Who did the Republican Party nominate? I already told you. And he lost. President Harrison. So the Republicans nominate President Harrison for re-election. Who do you think the Democrat Party nominates? Not Henry Clay. James Weaver. No. This will be a first. Former president. No, not that far back. Not Lincoln. Grover <laughs> Cleveland. So the Democrats nominate former president Grover Cleveland. And the Populist Party nominate James B. Weaver. So in this election, you'll have for the Republican Party, President Harrison running for re-election. For the Democratic Party, former President Grover Cleveland. And for the new Populist Party, which was organized and formed by farmers, they nominated James B. Weaver. The state or the uh, party votes for someone. I want, want me to go, I'll go through that at the end because that's a good question. It changed over the years, I'll tell you what it is now. Okay. Grover Cleveland gathers 277 electoral votes to that of Harrison's 145. So the third party candidate helped two. No, he lost. Helped Cleveland. So Grover Cleveland becomes the first former president to be elected president non-consecutively. So if you look at presidents, it goes Grant, Hayes, Garfield, Arthur, Cleveland, Harrison, Cleveland, and then to the next person. And he changed so he's here twice. Okay, that's why you see the same guy twice in there, which is, you might not have noticed. Mm -hmm. Now, the great thing for Cleveland, who's a Democrat, guess who took back control of Congress in this election? The Democrats. The Democrats. Okay? Now, Weaver actually got... 22 electoral votes. Not only that, though, he got over a million popular votes. So Weaver made a heck of a show for the populace, and his 22 electoral votes and his popular vote probably was a little bit of a difference in this election in Grover Cleveland becoming president twice, non-consecutively. Okay, before we have the review, then, I'm going to answer a couple of questions that were asked. Here's my first